Serotonin. Serotonin. Mm -hmm. So there's an interaction. But it, serotonin actually starts as a uh, as, as tryptophan. Are you f familiar with what tryptophan is? So tr what happens is tryptophan is converted into serotonin by an interaction between the gut bacteria and the gut cells themselves. So serotonin precursor combination with gut, the uh, gut epithelial cells, which is the lining of the gut, yeah. and the bacteria in combination, so which actually produce in, it. In harmony, then they can work their best. Yes. When, when the, the body is not strained with all these other autoimmune issues, mm -hmm. it's got then the space. It's, it's a function of having the right type of foods, the right ingredients to make the serotonin, but then also having the right type of bacteria to actually make it. So when, when the gut is in dysbiosis, meaning it's the wrong types, that's when you're going to struggle to actually produce the serotonin that you need. So it's shifting the balance. And is then the serotonin absorbed into the bloodstream to get to the brain where it works? Yes. Yep. There's an excellent point. The gut is connected to the brain via the enteric nervous system. So there's all these nerve endings in the gut. That's why they call it the second brain because it's directly connected to the brain via the vagus nerve. And the neurotransmitters like serotonin, there's others, dopamine, GABA, acetylcholine, all these things that impact how you function, how you feel, your moods. And what's really interesting is that the, the gut, the, the, through the gut enteric system, bacteria can actually communicate directly to your brain. And what's this really it fascinates me. Bacteria can actually form little gangs. <laughs> Has anybody come across, um, this is like really cutting edge science, quorum sensing? So quorum sensing is like this latest medical gut breakthrough on the microbiome. So what happens is groups of bacteria can form like a gang, like multiple species can form a gang and they can coordinate who they decide to kill off so they can produce antibiotics themselves and kill off different types of bacteria. They can also think, well, you sacrifice yourself for the greater good of the team. They can actually come to consensus. This is how smart these things are. We think that they're just like silly organisms, you know, like mindless things, but they actually can coordinate each other. So what I try and encourage is getting the wrong gangs out and getting the right gangs in because then they'll work for you, rather than having the wrong clicks in there. Isn't that fascinating? How do antibiotics um, affect them, like manufactured antibiotics? Yes, that is an excellent point. I was just about to touch on that, but I'll quickly talk about it. So antibiotics are very, very important. Don't, don't get me wrong. Very, very important for our civilization, for our health, to conquer a lot of illnesses. If you're sick, take antibiotics. It's important. However, when you take an antibiotic, there is a price to pay. Because studies have shown that a, a five-day course of antibiotics can wipe out a third of your microbiome. And some of these species you will not get back ever again. So it's, they're very powerful drugs. Typically they're very wide, like it's a, like a broad spectrum where they just wipe everything out. Everything. They don't actually only kill the the, the disease-causing microbe, they kill everything, including the good guys. And what typically comes back are not the good guys, because the bad guys are typically more resilient than the good guys. But I will continue on, and we'll touch on that in a second. What happens is when something starts, it takes a good 10 years before it gets to mainstream. If not 20. Hmm? If, not 20. if not 20 or longer, exactly. So how do we acquire our microbiome? Being born by Birth. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so, I'm a midwife. <laughs> exactly. So you, you understand like totally how this happens. This is pretty much from your mums. But what's an important point to understand is that it is a hereditary process. So you, the child will inherit what the mum has. So I pretty much have what my mum gave me. <laughs> and then the rest of it will come from the, um, the breastfeeding and the milk because there's a substance in, in the milk called human milk oligosaccharide. So it's not for the mum, it's not for the baby, it's for the baby's gut bacteria. And so hopefully, you know, with the, with the right birthing process and the proper
proper nutrition, breastfeeding. That's how the baby gets the, the biome that it gets. But sometimes you might have C-sections and all that. And then typically those kids will have a slight disadvantage as well. Nothing against C-sections and all that kind of stuff. But there is a difference between the two. So could I ask if yes. your mother had candida whilst pregnant um, and that gets transferred into the baby's gut health, how do you break that cycle, I suppose? It's an excellent question. So you look at, you look at the things that, that the candida feeds off. Mm -hmm. So typically there uh, would be some elimination type of yep. diet. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to do is you're going to starve the candida mm -hmm. by not giving it the food yep. and then putting in the good guys to then kill it. Okay. It's like lact very interesting with candida, lactobacilli mm -hmm. can actually, certain species, mm -hmm. spray it. <laughs> it actually sprays the, the candida with peroxide or hydrogen. Robin will show you <laughs> how she sanitizes her equipment, but there's bacteria <laughs> actually producing a sanitizing agent to kill off candida. So this is how we okay. address it. So is that the, that's the best one for candida? Lac lactobacilli and, and sugar. In, in elimination of sugar is yeah. the best way to control candida. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. So soil and environment is very important. So the baby will get to a certain age and then will start to explore out in, the, in the, um, the garden and whatnot and play in the soil. And this is how it gets inoculated with more, typically after the age of three. And then fundamentally, and then as we get older, it's our food. Food is a, a, like a massive driver of the type of gut bacteria that you have. And now I'm researching, is anybody familiar with allele microbiome and the work I'm doing on microbiome testing and all that? You might not be familiar with it. Yeah, so what we look at is the different type of, like a, what we call phala, which is the broad top end of the, the types of bacteria. And then we tell you, based on the, the organisms there, how to shift it to a you know, healthier style of bacteria. So it's mainly through diet. Diet is the biggest driver. You know, antibiotics, diet, vegetables, fiber. Fiber is a huge one because, you know, with short chain fatty acids, is anybody familiar with short chain fatty acids? And fiber is the biggest thing that's going to change your microbiome because the fiber can actually get into the colon, which is the very last part of your digestive system. And this is where the majority of the gut bacteria actually live. So diet is the biggest thing. So food and other things like xenobiotics, which is, it just means external influences that damage your biome. Now typical things will be like antibiotics, hormones, food additives, plastics, pesticides, and something most people don't realize, stress. Just being stressful is damaging to the biome as well. What's your general? Stress. So this is when you put from a stressful situation, you're producing this auto like toxicity from stress, pretty much. Does that make sense? Yep. And and again, antibiotics. It's not only a pill that you hear from the doctor. I've seen some studies recently. The big, does anybody want to guess the biggest source of antibiotics in food? Meat. Yep, beef, meat. It's the reason why is because. They use it because they produce more muscle mass in, in the actual cow or whatever they're feeding it to. And it goes in its feed. It just normally through a grain feed or whatever it's feeding. That's where the antibiotics are added. And it's heavily damaging to your biome. Like very, very damaging. And chicken, isn't it? Chicken. chicken yes. F from the feed. Yeah. From the feed. Because it just gives it more mass. Mm. So it's like more muscle means more money. That's what the food companies do. What about grain fed animals? What about yeah. grass fed animals? Gra grass fed is not mm. as big of an issue. Mm. The only thing is that if there's any pesticides sprayed, yeah, well, but if, it, if yeah. that's the only downside, but certainly not as bad as mm. the antibiotic situation for sure. Yeah. Mm. So just clarifying, mm. if it's organic, then you're fine? Generally, you should be fine, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's why I always encourage people, you know, invest in your health, buy good organic products, the best you can afford. Like, you can think of your health as, you know, like, wait till you get sick, or it takes some preventative medicine like eating well and eating good quality food, the best that you can afford. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what are, what are probiotics? Anybody want to guess? 
Mm. Well, I fall back to the World Health Organization definition, which is it's any bacteria that can provide, or it could be yeast, that can provide a benefit to the body. So there could be ones that actually colonize the gut. Most of them probably won't. Most of them are what we call transient. So it means they'll pass through and elicit a, a health benefit, but not colonize the gut. And most of them will actually be transient, which means that you need to continue to consume. And that's why it gets very expensive when you buy pills or buy things, because you have to continuously take it. There's only really two major strains of probiotics that have proper studies done, and that's GG, Lactobacillus GG, and um, Bifidobacter longum. It's only the really two well-studied ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, Kevin, if you were yes. taking probiotics every single day for two years, you really aren't building up your gut? Not, not particularly. I don't think. I think most of them are transient. I mean, most of them will pass through, and we'll see this in our gut testing as well. Like, from the sample sets I've looked at, not many people have bifidobacter in there, and that's one of the main ones that you have in yogurts and things like that, the probiotic ones. So they are beneficial, but they're transient, most of them. Well, how do you colonise your gut properly? So it has to be able to survive through the very harsh acidic environment. Then it has to compete with all the rest of the guys in there to somehow get a foothold yeah. on the gut, in the gut. Isn't there the other mm. option of a fecal transplant? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. yes. That's, that's typically for, for C. diff infections, which they uh, recommend a fecal matter. C. diff is extremely debilitating mm. and horrible, so some people resort to a fecal matter transplant, and it's about more than 90% cure rate, so it's highly effective. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And most of it's to do with fiber. It's yeah. fiber, and what I'll talk about next is which is fermented foods. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the supplements, which again, not a hell of a lot of studies on the supplements that I think there's traveler's diarrhea there's a couple of other things that they do I mean in terms of proper studies but I always favor fermented foods because they're more affordable they're something that you can do you know as a as a regular part of your your daily living it's very easy and we have thousands of years of history with fermented foods and Robin will hate this but <laughs> Cap Captain Cook this is <laughs> Sorry, I'm seeing <laughs> one of the reasons why Captain Cook was able to colonize Australia was because of sauerkraut and vitamin C and scurvy and all that. But yeah, they're very rich in probiotics, organisms, like lots of different strains, lots of variety. Variety is the key and they're very cost effective and they're totally natural. Yeah. But the most important thing is going to be diet, critically diet, especially vegetables. Eating, I would say, I've never talked about this in a course before, but I think you need a minimum of 30 different varieties of plant foods per week. And this is what the research is telling us. Different, different colors, like lots of, like when I, when I go to the grocer now, I'll go to a nice little organic grocer or the market, and I will look for every week something that I've never tried before. Because what it's gonna do is gonna force you to put different types of fiber in the gut that you're not typically used to. Like normally we'll have like you know, the same five veggies every week, lettuce, tomato, potato. But try it, be adventurous, try something different. It's gonna be hugely beneficial for your gut and your flora. They'll definitely thank you for sure.